beginning, um, well, after Grigori has spoken, <laughs> Uh, this uh, really reminds me uh, the Euronews uh, TV uh, uh, pictures. You know, there is uh, the, from time to time, there are uh, the uh, slides with no comments. And uh, I felt that maybe I don't have anything else to say, because how you can comment uh, on this comprehensive, um, uh, very, very objective and realistic uh, picture uh, what Russia is uh, today about. But not only, I think that uh, Grigori's words uh, on um, EU uh, direction, how EU uh, countries and especially some of them uh, see the partnership uh, with Russia uh, only through the prisma of uh, the economic um, relations and trade relations. This is something really uh, very serious, uh, what we should take into account uh, and, um, and try to improve ourselves, even if that is not, not easy at all. Uh, uh, money talks, and a uh, lot uh, in EU-Russia relations, this is clear. And, um, and uh, therefore, if we heard what Mr. Yavlinsky said, that the future of Russia is in the hands of Russians. Of course it is. First of all, it is in the hands of Russians. But also, I think that uh, we in Europe, in the European Union, have a sort of um, responsibility to, to, to encourage and help and assist uh, uh, Russian people to get back their democracy, to get back their constitutional rights. Uh, the constitution what was adopted by referendum in 1992 where all the democratic principles were laid down which are now stolen by the Kremlin regime. Uh, we in the West, we should be really uh, ready uh, to respond on more value-based uh, basis than only a business-based basis. But um, uh, just... Um, have some uh, dual notes here. Uh, well, starting from uh, the title, Russia as a democratic and prosperous neighbor in Europe. When I show first this um, proposal as a, for a title, then I was thinking that is that a joke or what is that about? Or is that a dream? And uh, even if I had the possibility to change the, the title, finally I decided not to change it. Because uh, still, I think that uh, Russia as a democratic and prosperous neighbor in Europe uh, should be our common goal. Uh, it's, a, it's a goal for Russian people and it's a very much goal for us in, in the European Union. But how to achieve the goal, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a really uh, the big question. Um, it has been already uh, 13 years when uh, uh, Mr. Putin has been in office and probably 11 years are ahead of us uh, seeing him in office, theoretically. It's a very long time and uh, there is no uh, leader in Europe who can have such kind of uh, uh, possibility to be so long in power. But uh, what I want to remind you is uh, the, uh, um, the, the words what Mr. Putin said in his very first public uh, TV uh, speech. It was um, in the eve of millennium when uh, Mr. Yeltsin handed over uh, his powers uh, on the 31st uh, December 1999 and when Mr. Putin made this midnight speech he said uh, something very important. He said that uh, this country, Russia, will uh, guarantee to all people the democracy he said that this country will guarantee the freedom of speech, freedom of conscience, and, very important, uh, freedom and rights for a private property. But also Mr. Yavlinsky referred. These were the words, the promises, uh, which were very encouraging in the beginning. And probably this was why uh, many Western politicians uh, received um, Mr. Putin, despite of this, his KGB background, still with uh, optimism and hopes. But uh, when uh, now, uh, 13 years um, later, we see what's going um, on in Russia, and if we just take uh, uh, 
uh, into account uh, on what we think, what we, how democracy is understood uh, uh, in the West and, and in Western value-based system, then um, probably uh, any of us can agree that Russia is corresponding today on the democratic principles or the prosperity. Uh, this is uh, the same, uh, uh, the same uh, uh, question. Despite of this economic growth, yes, Russia has uh, prognosis also for the next year to get to the economic growth like 3.6, uh, 3.7 percent. But at the same time, you should uh, see uh, it in correspondence of the price of um, oil, for example, and, and the, the decrease of the uh, oil price uh, as it stands today, approximately uh, nine, uh, less than uh, 93 uh, US dollars per barrel, then it's, uh, it's not um, something what uh, allow uh, Putin's uh, government or his regime uh, to guarantee uh, the, the prosperity and, uh, and successful uh, um, investment uh, to the social affairs, uh, spheres in, in, in Russia. Uh, yes, just some facts um, uh, speaking about uh, the uh, GDP per capita, uh, then uh, the figure is, uh, well, Russia is, uh, is a very um, big country with a huge potential, but still in these uh, 13 years in office, you see, uh, Russia has been able to achieve only on the 55th position in the world, according to the IMF um, uh, uh, figures. And uh, again, uh, speaking about uh, the perspective of democracy, then Freedom House, uh, the international big think tank, um, uh, which is um, uh, delivering every year uh, for all countries around the world uh, the perspectives uh, of, um, of democracy, then you see that they, they have found that uh, the press is not free, internet is partially free and the country in general is, is not free. Uh, and uh, seeing uh, the um, uh, EU-Russia uh, trade relations then again, it is uh, the fact uh, that uh, Russia is the third uh, trading partner for the European Union and the European Union at the same time is uh, the first partner for Russian Federation. And uh, it's also very important to mention that uh, the investments, um, uh, well, EU basically is the major foreign investor in, uh, in the current uh, Russian economy. And uh, these um, factors play, of course, an important role, and especially when Russia uh, joined uh, to the WTO, uh, World Trade Organization, last year in, in August, after 18 years uh, negotiations to join this organization, then again this um, uh, made an uh, important uh, impact in, in further uh, economic uh, relations between EU and, and Russia, despite of, uh, of the fact, of course, that uh, Russia has introduced uh, the new protectionist measures um, uh, at the same time when they joined uh, WTO, and you all know that there are disputes uh, between Russia and, and, and the EU uh, in this organization. Uh, concerning the recycling fee for vehicles, for example, or import uh, ban of non-live animals. I guess that this is also the, uh, the problem in, in Finland here. At least it is uh, the, the big uh, problem in, in Estonia concerning the ban of live animals. And, and of course, recycling fee is, is a very important uh, question uh, for German business, um, uh, which now uh, all these concerns are raised on, on the EU level, on the highest level, uh, the EU Commission, uh, Commissioner Karl de Kücht is, um, is, is, is very, very uh, strongly addressing this, um, this, um, these problems. And uh, speaking uh, about uh, Russia, we, we cannot, um, uh, we cannot, um, uh, 
that was interesting actually that Grigori didn't uh, mention at all uh, the, the, the modernization, the partnership for modernization and I know how critically uh, Russian opposition uh, is relating to this, um, considering uh, this uh, just sort of uh, small talk and, and uh, not something what is taking place in, uh, in reality in Russian society. Uh, it's it's uh, it's very uh, interesting that uh, Putin's um, uh, government is still uh, ongoing uh, with this uh, uh, rhetorics of um, modernization. Uh, but uh, soon uh, the EU side is is raising the question of uh, the modernization in not only in terms of technical modernization and not in terms of economic modernization of the country, but very much modernization, modernization, modern, modernizing uh, the civil society, modernizing, opening up the society through the democratic principles. Then we see immediately a big differences. Uh, uh, between uh, EU and, and, and Russia's attitude and, and uh, definitely uh, Putin regime is, uh, is seeing this modernization some uh, sort of uh, through the technocratic classes and not really understanding that none of the society can be a modernized uh, modern society without the freedoms and, and liberties of uh, people and, and, uh, and uh, for the for the um, representatives of, of um, NGOs. And, um, well, again, uh, one interesting fact that uh, speaking about the uh, modernization, Bertelsmann Transformation Index, so this is the organization which is uh, charging uh, different countries around the world about the modernization, then Russia uh, is placed in 2012 on the 99th place among uh, 128 countries in the world. So that means that this good idea what was started by President Medvedev um, uh, together with the European Union, the initiative was launched uh, a few years ago, uh, still uh, this um, uh, process hasn't really given the um, uh, effective um, results and uh, there are more and more doubts, uh, at least from the EU side, that uh, that if Putin can be successful at all with this modernization uh, process. Um, and now I come to the Eurasian Union. Uh, just um, this is um, something what uh, is um, not that much discussed in the European Union level, in EU institutions. Uh, but uh, having been following the Russian uh, developments, having had uh, several meetings uh, over the last year with um, my counterparts uh, uh, from the Russian uh, State Duma or the or the Federation, the the Council, the, the State Federation Council, then uh, it's uh, it's it's for me at least quite clear that uh, this Russian Union is something uh, what. Putin is very, very much committed to. And it looks to me that it's a sort of uh, top priority for uh, the Kremlin regime. Uh, Putin, I think, is a, is a very strong leader in this respect, that if he decides to achieve something, then he moves towards that direction. And it looks now that um, uh, the creation of the Eurasian Union is one of these, um, uh, his big goals. And if we, uh, well, again, if I may refer what uh, Grigori said, that how Russia will look uh, in uh, 20, 30 or 40 years, then, uh, then I think that uh, this um, map, perhaps what we can see behind the, uh, uh, here, is uh, something uh, what we should keep in mind. And, uh, and uh, this is um, not only about the customs union, like it looks in the moment between Kazakhstan, um, uh, Russia, and then Belarus, and, and uh, this, uh, the Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, uh, through the several uh, separate agreements within this union. It's a process what has been started 
and uh, it's about uh, not only the the economic or customs union idea but uh, it's uh, it's it seems that uh, there is a very very broad uh, the political idea behind it and uh, and uh, the tendency what also many analysts in EU say on Russia when they are speaking about Russia that the the Kremlin's tendency to renew the dominance over its closest neighbors, not through the political, not only through the economic ties, but very much also with the through the political ties, uh, is exactly uh, in the Eurasian context um, uh, now developing uh, quite um, actively and quite fast. And uh, and Ukraine is also here mentioned. You see, uh, this is the crucial uh, crucial uh, uh, moment. Uh, in the further development of the Russian Union, definitely. Because this year, 2013, it uh, seems that for Ukraine it is uh, the crucial year. Either they will join uh, with the European Union uh, through the association agreement, uh, uh, if that will be possible to sign it finally during the Vilnius summit uh, in the second half of this year, which would give the uh, more um, perspective for Ukraine uh, to get closer integration to the European Union, or if that will be not the case and, and um, Putin will be able to uh, integrate Ukraine to the Eurasian Union, uh, then I think that the whole development uh, for the European Union um, in relation with uh, Russia will make a big difference. And if Ukraine will join this Eurasian Union, uh, I think that in a few years' time then we can already speak about the relations not only between European Union and Russia, but between European Union and Eurasian Union. And this is exactly what, uh, in practics, uh, practical terms, also we we, we can see in uh, in uh, in Europe when we are speaking about the new PCA uh, negotiations between EU and Russia. Then uh, this is the Partnership and Cooperation Agreement. Then we see uh, more and more the political will from Kremlin side to negotiate not with Russia but to negotiate with uh, customs union, customs union of Kazakhstan, Belarus and Russia. And uh, even the European Parliament has been adopted uh, a resolution last year in December addressing uh, to uh, member states, governments uh, and the European Commission that in these negotiations with the new PCA we should not talk to a Russian Union but, not, uh, but only with Russia. So this is a, this is a, a big uh, interesting um, process uh, which will have a long-term uh, consequences uh, in, in our relations uh, with, uh, with uh, future Russia. I will not go to the smaller figures here or the details, you have seen them uh, already. Uh, and um, what else, uh, because we don't have enough time to go all this yeah, I can. I, I will not. Uh, I will not touch all these details. But uh, just um, uh, speaking about now uh, the uh, third part of of my introduction. Uh, this this comes to uh, this comes to the um, the the um, the moments. Uh, but um, already. Um, well, it's about the recent political events, but yes, the, the question is where from they started and, and uh, when the, the relations uh, between EU and, and Russia started uh, to uh, develop more like um, uh, in, a, in a, a tourist direction where we are losing the mutual trust to each other. Uh, this is uh, this is uh, the question. Yes, when they started, and and uh, when we can end with this mistrust, or is it going to grow the mis the, the atmosphere of of mistrust? Uh, I believe that the uh, uh, parliamentary elections in uh, two thousand eleven. 
uh, were one of the starting points, a real uh, uh, starting point when um, uh, the loss of uh, uh, of trust and, and um, uh, moving away from the common values uh, was uh, was so evident, so clear. Uh, when the parliamentary elections were clearly not free, not fair, uh, and then the presidential elections followed on this, uh, then uh, the uh, atmosphere, at least uh, in the European Parliament, if I can speak on behalf of the European Parliament, uh, the, the atmosphere started to change a lot because three years ago, it was almost four years ago, yes, when this mandate, uh, this, this parliament uh, was elected in 2009, then there was uh, still a lot of uh, openness, a lot of um, uh, readiness uh, uh, to conclude the BCA, to get the um, uh, energy uh, treaty with, uh, with Russia. That there was a hope that the new parliamentary elections, uh, new presidential elections, will give the, all this new impetus uh, for the further relations uh, with Russian Federation. But since uh, we, but, well, since the 2012, when uh, it was clear that Russia is principally turning uh, away from the democratic direction. Uh, and uh, Russia is not so interested in to conclude PCA, it's not interested in to, to conclude uh, the energy package. Uh, then also the atmosphere in the European Parliament vis-à-vis um, -vis Russia has changed a lot. And uh, this is uh, what we have been um, witnessing in the European Parliament uh, is um, is quite unique. Uh, never ever in the past, uh, like in one year, the European Parliament uh, has taken last year six or seven re resolutions on the situation in, in Russia, in political uh, situation, on the, on the economic situation, on the rule of law, on uh, the lack of um, uh, freedom of speech and, and so on and so on. So it's, uh, it's uh, in the moment, uh, it is uh, um, uh, the, the um, time when we, we are in a way uh, uh, in the parliament, um, uh, we are in the situation that we, uh, we are not able really to uh, find anymore the, the, the common language even with our Tuma counterparts. We have the um, partnership and uh, cooperation committee with uh, Russian uh, Duma members and, and state federation members. But uh, the meetings, uh, when we have the meetings, um, we don't have the common language. Uh, when the Foreign Affairs Committee uh, was, uh, of the European Parliament was in Moscow last year in December, then uh, the conclusion after that meeting uh, made by Mr. Elmar Prok, who is a very old, long member of the European Parliament since 79, his conclusion was that he never ever seen such an arrogant or ignorant uh, attitude from the Russian side uh, to discuss uh, of uh, issues uh, that should be in common interest. And this is, uh, this is, uh, this is the political atmosphere where we stand now and uh, and of course all this Putin's new legislation against the NGOs uh, well this Tima Yakovlev law uh, the facts that the NGOs are harassed now Kolos was the first one who witnessed uh, uh, the fee and and uh, we don't know uh, where it now uh, goes further uh, Magnitsky law uh, what was um, uh, what was, uh, yes, this is actually unfortunate, I cannot show you because of the technical uh, reasons. That was just a short documentary from the 6th of May last year in, from Bolotnaya, Ploshet, uh, where just the peaceful young uh, demonstrators were harassed by, by the police there. So, uh, uh, the um, uh, uh, the question is yes uh, how uh, we should uh, react on this what we see in Russia how uh, what what West can do actually yes we have this uh, Mercedes is in, in in Russia all around and and some other important business ties but uh, 
shall we stay silent? Uh, shall we just uh, turn our back to political opposition? Uh, shall we just close our eyes uh, uh, on that, what we see, uh, what's happening with the NGOs or what is happening with the press? Can we can we do it or not? And and uh, and you see, the first uh, uh, reaction was very strong, of course, um, in the United States of America when they signed uh, the uh, Magnitsky Act. Um, of course, there was um, the correspondence uh, from uh, from Russia at the same time. Uh, but uh, is that the way out from the situation? Um, European Parliament also last year in October adopted the recommendation uh, on the similar lines what the US already made a law uh, in Europe. Uh, currently, the process um, uh, of uh, what we call the process of Magnitsky law is going on, uh, but um, I believe that in Europe uh, we have much, much broader uh, concerns. It's not only those 60 people who are in this Magnitsky list who are guilty in his death or in his murder. But for Europe, the question is even much broader in the terms that this corrupted people, this uh, uh, black money, which is flying in by millions of euros to Côte d'Azur, uh, to London, to Berlin and, and other uh, places, or those uh, people who are uh, involved in human rights violations on daily basis, these uh, high officials, uh, in Russia, uh, uh, shall, we, shall we continue to uh, welcome them, them in, in EU countries? Uh, is it normal that the high official comes with a suitcase of uh, just cash, uh, millions of euros, and buying the real estate? How can this be stopped? Uh, these questions... Um, are now uh, currently in our political agenda in the Parliament, and, and we are working further to find uh, the, um, um, the methods how to react on that, what we see happening in, uh, in, uh, in the Russian Federation in terms of violations of human rights, but also how to um, um, uh, save uh, European countries uh, from uh, this black money flying in, because finally it's also the credibility of the European Union if we if we don't stop this kind of tendency. Uh, and um, and uh, 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 of course this um, so-called Magnitsky legislation, I, I repeat it all the time that uh, this is not against Russian people. This uh, this uh, this law, but or this. Uh, um, the political process, uh, it's, uh, it's against those individuals whom we really uh, should not welcome here in Europe. And, uh, and uh, of course Putin's propaganda is very much using uh, this Magnitsky law as something uh, against Russians, it's against Russia, but this is not true. If Putin uh, really would do what he says, that he wants to fight with corruption, then please, exactly this Magnitsky law, would be very much in uh, in, in favour of of, uh, of that. And yes, my last point actually, what I would like to uh, say here, how uh, also the West should respond uh, on the processes, what we see in uh, Russian Federation, especially in terms of uh, human rights and corruption. Uh, two years ago, uh, we in Helsinki here, actually, again, with the initiatives of uh, European liberals, together with Jablokko, together with Parnas, we had the first seminar in, uh, in November, uh, where we were discussing uh, how the West should uh, react, uh, and uh, we were discussing exactly re-initiating or re-launching uh, the Helsinki movement, uh, what uh, you all remember from the Cold War years time uh, under the OS, uh, OSCE process. Uh, we, we, should, uh, we should think nowadays how uh, to uh, make these uh, civil society movements in the West existing uh, and supporting uh, current um, 21st century uh, Russian Democrats, uh, human rights um, uh, activists who are so, so much uh, under the pressure by their own government, but who need, 
who really need the support from uh, the West, uh, the value-based support. And uh, we had had another, not only one, but two seminars now in Washington. And this year in uh, November, we plan to have a big uh, international meeting in Berlin uh, to really initiate uh, the, the big um, uh, movement uh, all across uh, European countries to, to restart, to relaunch in, uh, in the modernized way uh, of this Helsinki process. And hopefully we will be successful, not as a liberals, but we, of course, uh, would like to involve all other major European political forces, uh, starting from uh, European People's Party, Social Democrats, uh, Greens and, and others. So I thank you very much for your kind attention and uh, sorry to be a little bit eclectic perhaps, but uh, I tried to give a fast overview of what we have been doing in the European Parliament and of course I'm ready to answer the questions if there are any. Thank you. Well, first of all, uh, thank you for a very nice presentation, very enlightening indeed. Um, you, you mentioned... Uh, oh, hi, I am Björn Wunstorf. I study political science here in, in Helsinki University. Um, you, you spoke about, about EU integration, and, and, and I think it's almost impossible to speak about uh, EU-Russian relation without taking in, in, in account European in relations with, with the bordering states and the integration of them to Russia and, and what is your opinion on on, on Ukraine and, and Belarus? Should we keep them as, as the sort of buffered states we, we are very much keeping them today or, or, or should we integrate them more even though they have their problems with, with human rights and also countries that, that have slighter problems with, with, with human rights like, like Georgia who is is, is very much very fast integrating towards a European style, but still kept as a, as a buffer. Well, as comes to Belarus, then uh, in the moment this uh, country has uh, made the, the choice um, as a member of uh, the um, customs union. Uh, but at the same time, uh, uh, again, I think that we should not uh, close our eyes what's going on in Belarusian society in the terms of, um, of human rights and, and the freedoms. And, uh, well, the Belarusian opposition, the political uh, democratic opposition, the Belarusian civil society, the Belarusian media, they also need uh, the, the help, uh, the moral assistance, at least from the West. And when I was speaking about the relaunching the Helsinki Committee movement, of course, it's not only vis-à-vis -vis the Russian uh, society, but uh, it's in, uh, it's, it applies to Ukrainian society, it applies to Belarusian society and to the others, and maybe even not why not in Hungarian uh, society who also is uh, like Hungarian press is also under the pressure now by its own government. So but uh, Ukraine I think it's still it's a very very important country um, uh, for European Union as a partner because it's a big country with a huge resources but at the same time of course facing uh, its, uh, its own turbulences uh, in, in internal politics. I think that when I said that this year is a crucial year for Ukrainian development uh, in upcoming um, years, it's exactly the fact if they will be really able to sign uh, the association agreement, which is a very practical uh, um, modus vivendi for cooperation and, and would be very much beneficial for both sides, I'm, I, I'm sure, for the EU and, and also for Ukraine. And, and uh, what comes to Georgia, then uh, there have been still a lot of open uh, question marks uh, with this new government and uh, several uh, accusations. I've been meeting uh, now almost every month I meet somebody from opposition from, uh, from the government of, of Georgia. Uh, uh, I, I would like to believe that still that this government is uh, continuing the European and transatlantic integration uh, of Georgia uh, for, the, for the better future.
Now it's working. Okay, yes. So my name is Peter Hackman from Helsinki, Finland. I'm also from the Svenska Folkparti. So my question is uh, uh, to promote uh, future EU or let's say now, now EU Russian relations, would it be good to to try fast to get uh, it more possible to travel without visa between the borders of EU and Europe? What is your opinion on that? And, and, and how are you trying to, in that case, promote this? Hmm. Well, um, uh, well, as as uh, as a as a Finnish people and Estonian people uh, living uh, in neighborhood with Russia, I believe that uh, we for us would be it would be really very good to to have a visa freedom uh, in in many reasons. Uh, it's a people to people contact. Uh, I believe that more people, uh, Russian people, who come uh, to European Union and see by their own eye that uh, what the free society looks like, what the liberal society look, looks like, it's very good. And the fact is, by the way, interesting survey was recently what I read about uh, Belarus, that uh, most of those uh, Belarusian citizens who have been able to visit the European Union and when they returned to Belarus, they stopped to support the Lukashenko's regime politically. So, and this is exactly what uh, why I'm saying that more uh, liberal approach vis-à-vis uh, -vis Russian citizens is also very much important. Even perhaps uh, you live somewhere far away in Siberia, you maybe never come to, to Europe uh, using the visa freedom, but even if you have the knowledge uh, that, uh, and, and possibility that and you know that you are free to go, I think this also is sort of a, a very important emotional aspect. Of course, there are a lot of technicalities and, uh, well, uh, at the same time, I'm quite pretty sure that Putin regime is not interested at all to get this full-fledged um, uh, visa freedom to all uh, its citizens. What he is now fighting very hard is to get the visa freedom for the service passport holders, the, the people exactly who are in offices uh, in this uh, uh, of, the, of Putin's regime, uh, people most uh, likely, many of them, not all of course, but still I would say many of them are involved in human rights violations, are involved in corruption, and exactly this is the, this group of people whom Putin would like to give the privilege to travel to the European Union. And, uh, and I'm sorry that, uh, that Germany uh, has uh, uh, decided to, to allow it happening. It's not yet f finally decided on the EU level. And, and here ex again, practically, I see the, the, the possibility for the EU to, to uh, make a selection, um, uh, well, just putting the visa bans exactly on some of those um, service passport holders whom we know are exactly involved in human rights violations, like, for example, in the moment the Polotnaya processes are going on, all these charges, prosecutors, investigators, uh, these prison people who have been taken already, how many, 14, 15 young people, um, uh, the peaceful protesters to the prisons are detained. About uh, 20 people are still under the court trial. So this is exactly people who hold this uh, service passports, who are doing this, who are implementing this. And I don't see any reason why EU should welcome those uh, uh, chinovnik in, in, in the territory of the EU without um, uh, visas, while the ordinary citizens in Russia just will uh, remain dreaming about the visa-free travel. Yes, uh, my name is Andrew Erlan from the uh, Finnish parliament, from the Left Alliance Party. Russians often criticize the so-called West on uh, reading lectures on how, how they should organize their society. And um, <clears throat> I must say that uh, this was a very interesting pre presentation, but uh, kind of an example of that kind of a lecture. But um, um, my question actually is that you mentioned the Magnitsky Act uh, and is, do you think, consider that it is something that uh, the governments within the European Union, for example, the Finnish government or the Estonian government, should promote? And do you think that anything good or constructive could come out of this kind of a Magnitsky Act on a European level? Hmm. Well, I think this is in uh, EU's common interest uh, to uh, make uh, a common uh, set up a common policy. It's not only about one or two governments uh, who should initiate it. 
like uh, in Ireland, for example, um, uh, last week in Irish Parliament, uh, in the Foreign Affairs Committee, they started uh, the debate on the resolution uh, where the Irish Parliament is, is asking uh, their own government to bring the issue into the EU agenda. The same discussions have been taking place in UK, in the Netherlands as well, in Italy. Uh, the, these discussions, um, either more officially or less officially, are taking uh, now place uh, in several EU countries, also in EU Commission. Uh, the question is that, uh, that um, I, I'm not, uh, uh, I'm not um, speaking about uh, the proposal that the EU should introduce the similar Magnitsky Act as US did. But what I'm doing and what I'm promoting uh, and encouraging uh, is that the EU should um, be able to uh, find out the common policy, the common measures or even the common sanctions on much broader base uh, what uh, we see uh, and which is disturbing uh, us uh, in relations with Russia. It's only not about the 60 people who are in this Magnitsky list, but uh, for Europe, uh, uh, it's it's much much broader question of money laundering of black money flying in the corrupted people uh, uh, hanging around Europe uh, teaching their children in, in our universities these these questions should uh, be responded it's a long process it's it's not a matter of uh, one or two months but uh, but I'm 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 confident that uh, um, and uh, that the EU countries, the governments, are ready to uh, deal with these questions. We are discussing this question and also the European Commission is discussing this question now very much how to stand against this uh, uh, money laundering, for example. And in Helsinki there is another conference today taking place in parallel exactly discussing these uh, money laundering issues. It takes time, uh, like in Europe normally, the decision-making process is long, but I think we are moving that direction.